Thanks, uh, everyone. Um, it's great to see the uh, good uh, turnout today. I want to extend a warm welcome to, to all of you. And I want to, in particular, uh, echo my thanks uh, to the organizers and all the agencies that have come together for this collaborative uh, event. In particular, I want to thank Dr. Natalie Pang, the symposium uh, convener, uh, and her whole team, and all the agencies. Everyone's been working together uh, very, very hard over the last uh, couple of months, in particular, the last couple of weeks, uh, to put this uh, together. So what I want to do today is to, um, there's two of us talking uh, in this segment, myself and Natalie, I want to talk for five minutes to situate why we need to think and talk about digital well-being in this current moment. And then I want to pass on to uh, Natalie, who will explain a little bit more about the foundations or the indicators uh, of digital well-being. So digital well-being um, is a new terminology, you know, uh, so I want to spend some time to uh, just try to unpack uh, the meaning here. So uh, many different stakeholders in different parts of the world, including in Singapore, everyone uses uh, different uh, terminologies. In Singapore, IMDA uses the term digital wellness to refer to physical and mental well-being online. Right? And then all over the world, in particular in Europe uh, and the US, uh, people talk about uh, the impact of technologies and digital services on people's mental, physical, social, and, and emotional health. And across the, the platforms and tech companies, for example, you know, they're very concerned about crafting and maintaining a healthy relationship with technology. Uh, Google, in particular, uh, you know, talks about technology is meant to uh, further us, you know, and, and push us towards our aspirations and life goals, com uh, as opposed to being a dis distraction for us, right? So on the slide uh, here on the image, you see the uh, screen time uh, shot on, on the, the dashboard uh, from our phones. Uh, I hope some of us are actually using that because that's about uh, helping us to craft a balanced uh, relationship with uh, technology. So I want to talk about two key forces right now that are shaping uh, the prominence and importance of thinking about digital well-being. The first is increased technology use, and the second is increased online harms. So in Singapore, uh, we spend, in the last 12 months, we spend an average of 7.29 hours a day on the internet. This is the dig Digital 2022 Global Report, 1,000 users all over the world. Uh, Singapore, you can see the yellow little scribbles there. Uh, somewhere in the middle, the average is about, um, you know, kind of uh, six hours a day or three hours a day. Uh, and then the, the, the one in the lowest is Japan at about four point something hours. But number two is uh, Denmark at five hours. And uh, in Denmark, we know from yesterday's happiness index, number two in the world for happiness. So what is saying here is that the less time we're spending on internet, you know, the, the happier we are, right? So. <laughs> Let, let me go deep, uh, deeper into, we spend 7.29 hours a day on the internet. It's kind of divided into half. Half the time is on the phone, half the time is uh, on uh, the computer. So about 7.29 uh, hours a day is a lot. Uh, and you know, how does this impact our well-being? So according to the 2022 Global uh, Well-Being Report, and this is a report by uh, Lululemon and Elderman uh, Agency, also a survey of you know, about 10,000 users all over the world, you know, they reported that well-being is the highest amongst those who only spend one hour on social media. And this one hour on social media a day is about mindful uh, approach to crafting and curating uh, the content online. Right. So, and in Singapore, in this report, you know, deep dive into Singapore, what are we seeing? We're seeing here um, Singaporeans, so the global average is three hours a day we spend uh, online, and Singaporean Gen Z spend 3.25 hours a day. But out of that group that spend 3.25 hours a day, 40% of them said that they experience negative well-being. And this is despite the fact that what we're seeing over there, in the, over there is uh, in Singapore, well-being has gone up, right? In 2022, uh, 2021, it was like 66% only experienced good well-being. In 2022, it's 68%. Despite the fact that well-being indicator has gone up, we're seeing, you know, uh, our Gen Z population, our young people spending time on internet, not, not really very high, you know, three and two, five hours a day, but 40% of them saying this is negatively uh, impacting uh, their mental health. So what we have then here right now is to then say, you know, technology use has a correlation 
correlation to mental health, right? The more time you spend online, the lower your mental health or your well-being will be. So that's, that's important to consider. Now, that's the first uh, factor. The second factor is uh, online harms, okay? The rise in online harms, uh, that is also requiring us to uh, start to think a lot more about digital well-being. So, uh, online harms, uh, many, many things it refers to. You can see what it refers to uh, on, on the chart here. Misinformation, uh, personal attacks, uh, hate crime, cyberbullying. So this is from the Microsoft uh, Global Safety Report that came out uh, last month, and also 10,000 users all over the world. The bigger the box, the, the higher, the, 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 higher the, the harm, right? So number one online harm at the moment uh, is misinformation. And um, deep dive into the country uh, in Singapore, uh, we have, if you can see Singapore SG, 77% of people uh, say they have experienced uh, a risk online last year. And uh, the global average is about 69%, but in Singapore is 77%. And what are the top five uh, online harms uh, in Singapore? Uh, you can also see the column uh, on Singapore. Number one, misinformation or disinformation. Number two, hate crime. Number three, uh, real world graphic violence. Number four, uh, cyberbullying, harassment and abuse. And number five, threats of violence towards oneself or um, other people. So, you know, these are the things that are on the rise. Uh, you know, 69% all over the world. Uh, it, it, people all over the world have experienced that. In Singapore, it's 77%. So suffice to say, um, you know, the experiences of online harms, you know, differ across gender divides, right? So uh, young uh, teenage boys, for example, they will experience a lot more the kind of terrorist violent content, you know, graphic content, and they worry about that. Uh, teenage girls will experience a lot more sexual solicitation, suicide, and self-harm. But whatever it is, I think, you know, the report also says parents underestimate uh, the kinds of online harms that children face online, and consequently, as a result of that, you know, it's uh, also very difficult to talk about it. So what we want to do today is also to give uh, ourselves a chance to talk about it, uh, find a vocabulary, you know, to talk about it, find some of the indicators for us to, you know, kind of see whether we can assess uh, that. So this kind of statistics is very similar in, like, in Singapore, right? In the Straits Times, I've also done a whole lot of survey in the last 12 months, you know. Um, the, on, on the slide on your, um, on your left, right? Uh, you know, and this was 12 months ago, they did that. It said 47% uh, of people experience online harm, uh, but 43%, uh, sorry, but no, no one will actually do anything about it because they don't think doing anything about it will change. So this is 12 months ago at 43%. Uh, and just now the Microsoft you know, Global uh, Online Safety Survey, we're looking at 77% have experienced uh, online harm. And in particular towards young people, right? So young people then, one in three you know, young people uh, are saying that you know, they, they have uh, s is suffering low uh, mental health, right? Anxiety, depression, uh, and sadness. So very, very important to, for us to come together to have a vocabulary to talk about it, to be able to unpack it, to be able to then find the tools and strategies to be able to uh, mitigate uh, online harm. So why is digital well-being uh, important? So people are spending so much time on the internet. We need to do something about the kind of time we spend on the internet. Technology use has impact on our mental health, right? Post health, healthy technology use can, can do all sorts of wonders, right? Improve productivity, uh, improve online safety, promote active lifestyle, foster holistic growth, but poor technology use can lead to increased online harms, anxiety, depression, addiction, and low life satisfaction. So currently in the world, there's only one uh, measure, one index that's as close to digital well-being as it can be, and it's the, the digital quality uh, of life uh, index. And Singapore ranks number six, you know, in digital quality of life in the world. But there's only two indicators that measure technology. The first one is on hardware, right? Measure that kind of technology hardware. How many computers you have? How fast is your broadband speed? And then the second indicator is your access. Access to, you know, uh, government e-services, you know, whether you have access or not. So this index, whilst it's good, uh, and it puts Singapore in a positive light, it really doesn't tell us about the people the people who use uh, uh, the internet ourselves, like what we do online and how our online participation and engagement can actually affect 
uh, you know, our, our well-being. So this is what we want to do. We want to say, you know, we need to understand digital well-being because it will make us as a population, as individuals, as groups, a digitally uh, resilient uh, group of people, right? Uh, and to do that, we need a vocabulary, we need tools, we need strategies. So we need to understand digital well-being through uh, the new framework. Uh, my colleague, Natalie Pang, will talk more about digital citizenship. Uh, thanks, Audrey. Um, so we uh, so just to say that this is actually part of a larger project we've been working on for, say, about like more intensely the last two to three years. Uh, and for us, uh, we really uh, want to understand and look at digital well-being through the lens of digital citizenship. Now, let me uh, talk about uh, the digital citizen. Uh, Karen Mossberger in 2008 defined the digital citizen as simply those who use the internet regularly and effectively. Now the key word here is effectively, right? Um, so uh, that brings me to actually the key aspects of digital citizenship. Uh, for us, digital citizenship is informed by the broader concept of uh, citizenship. It's just like how many of us are citizens, right? Of um, uh, yeah, a, a country. It means that there are rights and responsibilities, uh, but also information and skills uh, that we need to know in order to make informed uh, decisions. And just like being a citizen, a digital citizen is also not alone. And this is a very important part. Should be mindful about how we socialize and interact uh, with others responsibly and if respectively, uh, as well as how we empower and impact others. So, uh, there are four aspects of digital citizenship that we recognize in our work. Uh, the first uh, aspect is rights and responsibilities. I will share about each of them in a while. Uh, the second aspect is digital skills, and this is really about abilities, competencies, literacies. Uh, the third uh, aspect uh, that is really important, and, um, and, and I think sometimes this third aspect on digital identity uh, it's kind of subsumed under our understanding of, about digital skills, but for analytical purposes, we really want to identify it, right? Um, and this is digital identity. Uh, and the fourth aspect is digital empowerment. <coughs> now, let me elaborate each of these. Uh, what are rights and responsibilities? Uh, for us, rights basically are the freedoms and protections that come with our laws and regulations. Uh, and and responsibilities come with rights, right? Uh, the, and responsibilities really uh, is referring to the responsibilities we have towards ourselves and others. Uh, the main thing I want to say about rights and responsibilities is that they are equally important and they should always go together. Uh, for instance, uh, while there are fundamental protections uh, under laws that every society has, uh, digital citizens as digital citizens, there are also responsibilities uh, we have towards each other. Uh, for instance, right, uh, while we should be protected, we, there should be no harm that falls on us, we should not do harm towards others and not to perpetuate discrimination towards one another. Uh, now, these rights and responsibilities as viewed under digital, the digital citizenship uh, framework uh, they manifest differently as indicators of digital well-being, depending on the domain of digital life. Uh, let me just take a um, few examples um, to illustrate. Uh, for instance, many of us use platforms. We use uh, actually many services online. We also buy things uh, you know, on platforms such as Grab, Shopee, and so on. Uh, so this refers to our daily, sort of daily digital consumption, right? And um, in terms of, in the context of rights and responsibilities, uh, this means that um, every citizen, digital citizen, should have some rights of access, right? Um, there should be some level of connectivity, uh, some fundamental uh, um, uh, level of access for us to access these uh, platforms in order to do the things, complete the transactions and do the things we want. Right. But at the same time, uh, there must be some level of security as well as privacy, even as we actually um, go about with our digital consumption. Uh, just to illustrate with another example, in the context of building social relations, uh, rights and responsibilities can look like this. Right? Uh, it can 
uh, look like online safety, right? Um, it means that even as we actually interact and uh, actually communicate and use digital platforms to do all of that, right? Um, each, each of us, right, should uh, not be harmed in any way, right? And there should also be freedom from harassment at the same time. Um, thirdly, right, uh, one other uh, sort of uh, domain of digital life that we recognize in our work is also uh, digital creativity. Now, um, this is relatively new, uh, and uh, rights and responsibilities under digital creative creativity, I'm sorry, uh, could look like this, right? Uh, it means that uh, as uh, uh, actually participants and actually uh, creators online, uh, we have rights and responsibility over con the content that we create. Um, and this means, for instance, respecting copyrights, also acknowledging um, yeah, how content that we use from others should be acknowledged, and so on. So. The second aspect of digital uh, citizenship that we uh, that's important in our framework is digital skills. As I mentioned, this really refers to the abilities and competencies uh, to use uh, digital devices, communication applications, and networks. And uh, likewise, sorry, my animation didn't work here. Uh, digital well-being indicators, right, uh, as driven by digital skills, uh, can look can manifest differently. And one indicator of uh, digital well-being that's really, I think, important is the notion of self-care, right? Digital self-care, uh, and, um, and this, if we look at it from the lens of digital skills, uh, can refer to knowing how to use our devices, use our platforms in a balanced way, right? Uh, I think Audrey talked about screen time, right? That's an example of a practice, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, speaks to uh, a kind of digital skills that relates to self-care. Uh, secondly, right, um, in the context of digital employment and entrepreneurship, uh, digital skills can uh, manifest as uh, having, you know, just basic practical skills uh, that we have for work and entrepreneurship. Um, I like this, uh, I put this uh, uh, illustration here, right, uh, to kind of remember a story that the um, uh, sort of a research participant shared with me before. So this was, um, uh, yeah, a man in his like late 50s. And when I was doing the research, he was sharing with me that, oh, I left uh, my job in a school because uh, I couldn't keep up with e-learning, right? Uh, so he was actually, he began his story by sharing how difficult it was for him to learn technologies. Uh, but um, uh, in the second half of the interview, he showed me his uh, Facebook page that he used to sell cakes that he bakes from uh, at home, right? So I think uh, I, I want to actually share this story to illustrate that uh, the domain of digital skills, right? And this picture of how we use digital technologies for work, for entrepreneurship, for our own employment, uh, and for our own career pursuit can evolve. It is uh, actually not a straightforward story of just how certain populations can use or not, right? Um, so uh, many factors actually come into play, but basically digital skills, uh, and this is across all populations, right? Uh, basically refers to having that uh, practical skills uh, to pursue work and careers. Um, and yeah, again, back to the domain of digital consumption, right? Um, and digital skills uh, could mean having the necessary skills to consume, to use um, online platforms, including e-government and uh, e-commerce services. Now, uh, the third aspect of digital citizenship is digital identity. Uh, this is really about how we represent ourselves online, and it has an impact uh, I'm going to talk about two, right? Uh, not just on how people, how others perceive us, but it also has an impact on our privacy, safety, and security. So um, it does have uh, actually quite a number of uh, associations, even with the digital rights and responsibilities I talk about. But in the context of digital identity, right? Um, oops, sorry. Uh, for instance, uh, in the domain of uh, developing and maintaining our social ties online. Uh, yeah, uh, so one thing I could say is that uh, it's, 
very easy, right, uh, to connect with someone. But it, it takes actually knowing, it only takes knowing how to search, where to click, right, um, to connect or add someone, for instance, on our LinkedIn. But it requires thought and uh, actually a meaningful curation of our online identity to convert these connections into rewarding relationships online. Uh, productive and rewarding relationships online. And this could manifest in um, practices such as creating social media profiles in order to engage and develop meaningful relationships with others. Or managing our footprints uh, in the form of, you know, um, being mindful of our browser history, right? Uh, being mindful of what online sites are collecting about us, right? Or even in the context of uh, digi digital civic participation, having some kind of uh, civic identity online. Right, uh, in order to actually participate and uh, actively right, uh, in uh, civic causes that we believe in. Uh, the last aspect of digital citizenship I'd like to share about is digital empowerment. Right? And this is really a community-oriented aspect of digital citizenship. Uh, it means and it involves viewing us not just as individual cities, digital citizens, but members of communities. Right, um, and I, for me, this is perhaps uh, one of the most important aspects of digital citizenship uh, because uh, it is through this lens, right, uh, we do not position individuals only as end recipients requiring some one-way assistance and support from authorities and agencies, but uh, digital citizens having also uh, the capacity to develop their human potential over time and as part of a community. So uh, this also means that uh, yeah, across different domains of digital life, individuals go beyond functioning as individual digital citizens, but also connect their practices, but also help each other as part of a community. And that is why we call this digital empowerment. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna leave you just two examples, right? For instance, in the context of managing and building relationships, Digital empowerment drives us to use technologies to facilitate collaboration, work with and support each other. Uh, new mothers, for instance, uh, and I share this because I was once a new mother, right? Um, may find themselves seeking help and support uh, from each other using a variety of platforms because uh, they needed um, that kind of uh, collaboration and support. In, a, in the context of civic participation, uh, digital empowerment involves community members kind of mobilizing and sharing knowledge with each other for particular civic uh, causes and purposes. Uh, I'm gonna share just one example here. This is uh, r slash zero waste subreddit community. And this community has actually to date, I just checked this morning, over a million um, members worldwide. Uh, what do members do here? They share tips, they share advice, they share resources. Uh, basically to encourage each other uh, to reduce waste and live a uh, um, zero waste um, lifestyle, right? It's about sustainability. Uh, now that's just one example of what, I'm, what we mean by digital community building, right? Through, in the context of digital part civic participation and this involves actually empowering each other, involves helping each other uh, towards a cause that they identify with. Uh, as in conclusion, right, I'm gonna leave you with just two questions here for you to think about um, yeah, uh, throughout the day. Uh, firstly, what are your stories of digital well-being? Uh, what are your stories in terms of, especially in the context of the indicators I just shared? Are they related to digital rights and responsibilities, uh, skills, identity, or empowerment? Uh, I'm gonna be around uh, for Q&A, right, <laughs> later throughout the day. So feel free to approach me if you have questions. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.